Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stu again. We are back talking about the Federal Railroad Administration's high-speed rail corridors. In this video, we're going to look at the Florida Corridor. This is the corridor that Brightline is currently utilizing and hopes to build out between Miami and Tampa, Florida. We're going to talk about the origins of the corridor, look into some of the drama involved, talk about what Brightline has done so far, and then look at where Brightline is hoping to go in terms of better fulfilling the high-speed rail vision of the Florida metros connected by their service. As with most active higher or high-speed passenger rail projects, things got going in 1992 when the Federal Railroad Administration designated the first five high-speed rail corridors, Florida included. The Florida corridor was originally described as running from Tampa through Orlando and then down to Miami via Florida's East Coast. Florida got ahead of the game in 2000 by passing a state constitutional amendment to mandate a high-speed rail system of, quote, at least 120 miles per hour between its five largest metro areas. Interestingly, this was to be built somewhat as Brightline in reverse, where they would start with the Tampa to Orlando leg and then end up in Miami later. After this constitutional mandate, the Florida legislature created a high-speed rail authority to oversee planning and construction. The process went pretty far for the Tampa-Orlando segment, there is a final environmental impact statement and a record of decision, so at one point it was all clear to design and build. A portion of Interstate 4 between the two cities was redesigned to create a large median for the train, and that structure still mostly exists. Here's where it gets weird. In 2004, Florida had another constitutional amendment vote to remove the mandate to build these train lines. It's only four years, is Florida schizophrenic? Around the same time, there was a lot of reform in the Florida constitutional amendment process. The vote in 2000 to mandate the trains had 53% support. The vote in 2004 to remove the mandate had 64% support. So it looks like the first one snuck by the voters and four years later, there was some buyer's remorse. But that's not the end of the story, it gets weirder. The High Speed Rail Authority was still around. They just didn't have anything to do because the Florida legislature had defunded the project. Well, in 2009, the authority doesn't end around, applies for high speed inner city passenger rail grants and gets about a billion and a quarter. Wisconsin and Ohio both got high speed rail inner city passenger rail money that year and turned it down, which meant Florida was going to get even more. Back to the drama. At that point, the then governor of Florida, Rick Scott, steps in and rejects the federal funds. Doesn't want taxpayers subsidizing the boondoggle or some such ridiculous rhetoric. Florida Supreme Court backs him up and that's that. The Department of Transportation sends the funds elsewhere, including to California. If that had not happened, what would that train have been like? First off, it wasn't electric. It was going to use Bombardier's jet train technology, which is basically an Acela Express with a turbine engine. It was supposed to cruise at 150 miles per hour in service with a top speed of 168 miles per hour. A channel named High Speed Rail Canada has some footage of that. I put a link in the description. If you're coming in from a global warming perspective, not quite what you're looking for, but a true high speed train nonetheless. One advantage of this tech, of course, is no need for catenary wires, so you could easily run this in a mixed system to better utilize existing freight rights of way without as much headache from the freight rail companies. The organization ownership and naming of the brand, which is now Brightline, is convoluted, so for simplicity's sake, I'm going to just refer to any Brightline-related entity as Brightline. A year after the Florida High Speed Rail project is dead, Brightline pops up announcing it wants to run service from Miami to Orlando. That's part of the Florida High Speed Rail corridor, but Brightline hasn't gotten any high speed inner city passenger rail money for it. Brightline has mostly been paid for by loans and bonds with some small federal grants for things like grade separations or safety improvements. The Department of Transportation, Federal Transit Administration, 
and Federal Railroad Administration have a lot of different programs and grants. Brightline gets its first leg up and running from Fort Lauderdale to West Palm Beach and quickly expands to Miami. It's about 70 miles, 79 mile per hour speed limit. Takes about an hour and 15 minutes for an average of 55 miles per hour. Pretty typical Amtrak type stuff, but the trains are nice and new and the stations are new and nice. The service is good. Things that make up for the train not being the fastest. If Brightline were an Amtrak route, it would have the second highest ridership outside of the NEC behind the Pacific Surfliner in California. They're also into land acquisition, investment and development with their station sites, diversifying beyond ticket sales and concession. Investment in the company keeps coming in. That allowed them to acquire the Desert Express project, which we now know as Brightline West. It also allows them to expand from West Palm Beach to Orlando on a $5 billion project, which will be operating around September of this year, 2023. Brightline is owned by the same company that owns the right of way that Brightline runs on from Miami to Coco. Because of that, Brightline was able to upgrade those tracks to class six or 110 miles per hour max without any issues. That's not to say these lines aren't without their issues. Brightline has foregone a lot of grade separation and has taken heat for fatalities in the rights of way it uses. They also have a problem with the St. Lucie movable bridge, which could impact their scheduled service to Orlando once it starts. Speaking of Orlando, the capstone of the new segment from West Palm to Orlando is a brand new alignment from Coco to Orlando International Airport along State Route 528, which is rated as Class 7 or 125 miles per hour max. Brightline uses Siemens Charger diesel electrics that are designed to cruise at up to 125 miles per hour. Brightline has tested them on the Coco to Orlando portion at 130 miles per hour as part of the route certification. If Brightline continues on to Tampa as planned, that segment will likely match the capability of the Coco to Orlando portion with the same tech. Express service between Miami and Orlando is currently planned at three hours or a 78 mile per hour average. The Orlando Tampa route should be able to cruise at 125 miles per hour for about half the distance of 85 miles and would make the trip in about an hour. This would be close to the planned time for the Florida high-speed rail train that never happened. Average between Tampa and Miami would be 80 miles per hour. It's a fast train for the US. It's a solid intercity passenger rail line, but hardly high-speed rail as the rest of the world defines it. Let's take a look at the proposed Orlando to Tampa route, what that could support and what it would take to get that to a 150 mile per hour standard. The proposed route from Orlando International to Interstate 4 is about 12 miles and rather serpentine on shared track. There are a few less than 60 mile per hour curves, so this portion will be slower speed. Once in the I-4 right of way, the train would travel in a median that is prepared for it part of the way. This overpass is an example. The median is 140 feet wide there, but is as narrow as a more typical 50 feet in other areas. The Orlando half of the 85 miles is straight and any curves are high speed. Here's an example. At over two miles in radius, this curve can handle any speed a charger or the tilting jet train could have managed. This continues for another 15 miles westward until reaching this curve. Radius is about 3,800 feet, which would support around 90 to 110 miles per hour, depending on the train type. There are other similar curves in this area that would likely keep speeds under 110 miles per hour for around 20 miles. The final problem is this curve on the eastern edge of the Tampa Metro. At 2,000 feet, trains would need to slow to 60 or 70 miles per hour. This speed would likely be maintained through the Tampa area. As is, the jet train could have averaged about 105 miles per hour here for an express trip of 50 minutes on a similar route 
to the preferred route from 2005. They planned it as a local with three intermediate stations and a 65 to 70 minute trip. It is possible to improve things slightly. These curves can be straightened enough to maintain 150 miles per hour with a tilting train for an additional 20 miles. This would bring average speed up to 116 miles per hour and cut 5 or 10 minutes off the trip. With this route and its limitations, diminishing returns pop up pretty quickly. An example, the bad curve in the Tampa area is only 7 miles from the station site and would require significant destruction to remedy. As far as Brightline goes, its performance between Tampa and Orlando should be similar to what the route can bear albeit with a top speed of 125 miles per hour. This should result in express travel times in the 55 to 60 minute range, pretty close to the original intent with the jet train's capabilities, at least between Tampa and Orlando. Between Miami and Orlando, you'd need a lot of grade separation and new structures to get up to true high speed, and I don't think Brightline has any real motivation to do that. It's also not super clear what would happen in Florida with population growth given the threat of rising sea level impacts that could put significant amounts of Southeast Florida underwater in as little as 100 years. It's going to be interesting to follow the development of Brightline to Tampa and also Brightline West because assuming things go to plan, those trains could be the fastest in the country on average until California High Speed Rail can get Merced to Bakersfield operating. All depends when each of those can complete. If you have any opinions about this video or just High Speed Rail in general, please leave them in the comments. Still several more Federal Railroad Administration High Speed Rail Corridor videos to come, and more city pair investigations. Up next is Stu's News for August 2023 on July 28th. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big, beautiful freeway.